Wonderful. Well, welcome to Flashback 2017. Who, who's the first time they've ever been to Flashback this year? Yeah. Who's been here more than five times? Yes. These are my people. First Wonderful. And who's been here? Has anybody been here every year? <laughs> Go Steve! Um, my name is Heather Wixon. I am the managing editor of DailyDead.com. Um, I am so happy to be back here this year. This I think is my seventh year uh, helping out with Steve and Nick. Uh, they've been gracious enough to let me come up here and talk a little bit with some of the, the guests. Um, we are waiting, I think, on one more folk, one more person. You know, I'll bring them on and I'll wrangle the last one. All right, cool. About that? Um, but just a quick reminder before we get started tonight, does everybody have their tickets for Dream Master? Yes! Excellent. Well, there are still some tickets available, but it is expected to sell out. So if you haven't got your passes wow. yet, I would yeah, do that soon so because you may not be able to get in tonight if you wait much longer. Um, and you're not going to want to miss it. There's going to be a special uh, performance from Tuesday, a really great Q&A, and then you're going to get to see the movie outside on a big screen, um, which is actually how I first saw it uh, over at the now defunct drive-in and twin, uh, the twin drive-in and wheeling, if anybody remembers that place. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and bring everybody out. Uh, do we have Freddy vs. Jason fans in the house? Yeah! Excellent. I know this was a movie I was super excited for when it came out in 2003, uh, and I'm so excited we get to celebrate it today. Um, one quick I forgot we won. Ken. 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 So I won't start with Ken. We got his mom, though. We got Ken's mom, though. <laughs> Let's go ahead. It's going to be enough for you. <laughs> and then we also have uh, Catherine Isabel. really uh, uh, comfy, convenient chairs here. Uh, oh yes, uh, and also once we, we're going to talk for a little bit and then if you guys have questions, there's microphones on both sides of the room. If you want to line up, you'll get a chance to ask questions uh, in a little bit. So yeah, okay, well, well let's get started. I'm going to start with Jesse and with Catherine being sort of, you look scared. So I'm starting. You're starting with me? Well, what's the good Do it. Of you? Go. All right, we can do this. Favorite cereal? Fruitless. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm recording. Um, yeah, so I would love to hear from the two of you guys coming into this and being these characters, which you guys are kind of like the worst couple ever, but in like the best possible way. I don't know how to explain it. Um, but try and give love. love. Young love. <laughs> it's, it's really young love. Um, but I would love to hear from you guys in terms of okay. what it was that you saw these characters initially coming into it and how you sort of worked that camaraderie. Was that all in the script or did you guys kind of meet and be like, you know, it'd be a little fun if we were just kind of like button heads a little bit as, as a Oh no, it was all written. We were the worst characters. <laughs> we were terrible people. <laughs> um, yeah, that was all there. I don't, we didn't have a lot of improv -y stuff. I mean, they gave me actual menthol cigarettes to smoke, which I thought was sort of unnecessary. <laughs> like, do they have to be menthol? It's like, it says in the script. I'm like, okay, I get Does it have to be menthol? <laughs> so, so Ronnie was very committed to that script. We were all very committed. <laughs> yeah, those were gross. Yeah, those are gross. Yeah. So that was easy for me to say those things. <laughs> uh, for me, I mean, honestly, just to act like such a dickhead was kind of newish for me, I suppose, and then it sort of kept, <laughs> it just kind of kept happening, probably for like 10 years. Yeah, yeah, like, you really settled into that. Bring that guy in, he's the dickhead. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just played the mean guy for a long time after that. I actually auditioned for Monica Kina's role, and they were like, that's great, that's great. Can you come back for the slutty, bitchy best friend? <laughs> so I don't know what they saw in me. <laughs> Welcome, Ken. Well, I'm glad that you're here now because my next question would be for you and for Paula coming into this movie. But you guys are both playing iconic characters that have already sort of existed for decades. Was that daunting at all to come in, you as Jason, you as Mrs. Voorhees, and sort of get into the headspace of those characters that horror fans? 
come to love for, for you know, 20, 30 years at that point. Go ahead. Oh, uh, well, first of all, I'm an actress, and it was a job. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and in fact, I, I, as I recall, Ronna Yu, who was the director, uh, when I went out for it, I, one of the things I did was scream. And I can really scream, really loud. So I always thought that probably got me the job. That, and apparently I seem really enraged and evil. <laughs> I, 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 would, I was just too dumb to know what a big deal it was. Uh, <laughs> I went in for the stunt coordinating job, and uh, they offered me the, uh, the Jason job. And uh, that's sweet, that's... Uh, it's easier, <laughs> and uh, didn't find out till later on. Um, you know, when I started promoting the show and stuff like that, and Robert and I would go into a radio station and do a, do a, a little deal there, and we'd come out, and there'd be fans waiting for us outside. And, and uh, I turned to Robert one day. I think we were in San Diego for the Comic Con there, and, and you know, you know, wouldn't this be cool if it was like number one in the box office? And, and sure enough, it was for two weekends in a row. So uh, I really didn't learn about what a big deal it was to, to play Jason until after the fact. Um, I just had fun with it. Excellent. And also, um, Paula, for you, I think what I like the most about Freddy versus Jason is that it's different aspects of both Jason and Freddy as characters than we've ever seen before. Uh, and also Mrs. Voorhees, because she's a little more intense, there's a little more manipulation. How was it sort of working with Ronnie then in terms of, did you ever feel like you wanted to pull that character back a little bit, or was she just a ferocious fixture uh, 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 against Jason in this? Like, yeah. it's, it's terrifying to watch you. And I mean that as a compliment. <laughs> no, I, rarely, you know, an actor likes nuance, you know? You always like to give uh, humanity to your character, um, even when you're playing a, you know. But it wasn't like that with this. This seemed black and white. This was not about uh, showing her human side, and it really wasn't a, a chance in the script to do that. As I look back at the lines, there's nothing. Of course, you could say, oh, uh, well, I did get a chance to show my love for my son. <laughs> Mommy, come, go, oh, Jason, you could never die. So there was that, <laughs> actually, as I recall. I did, and this was, in my mind, to justify, because actors do, um, that I was, I was that way because they killed my son. That's right. When I wasn't looking, when I entrusted him to the care of the counselors, they killed him. So uh, this is a mother who has the kind of vengeance that uh, a lot of mothers would have. So in that, in that sense, you know, I could justify that. But as far as, as, far as you know, the screaming and the, and the killing part, there's no room for loving in that, except loving to kill, <laughs> scream and yell, and love and hate, you know, if you want to get the kind of big scream of love. <laughs> anyway, I could go on and on expounding on the psychology of this character, but I won't. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little nervous right now, <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, um, the core, the core of this movie, obviously, is you and Kelly and Monica for the, you know the, the three of you guys together. Did Ronnie give you guys time to sort of hang out a little bit and kind of get that camaraderie? No, no. Kelly, it? Kelly was like, "Girl, you know, come over to my house. We're gonna make you fried chicken. We're gonna hang out. We're gonna go eat sushi." Like it, the three of us were doing that on our own. <laughs> oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And they uh, they were staying in a hotel fairly close to where I was living at the time, so it was easy to just go and hang out. And just mostly eat. We mostly ate. That's what we did. <laughs> I also wanted to know, um, was there the red hat? I always thought it was such a fun, interesting like note to your character. Was that something that you brought into it, or was that already decided? I always wondered about no, that. No, the character's wardrobe was sort of already decided. It was like the tomboy with the... Which is funny, because that's how I usually dress. I'm usually wearing like some kind of plaid with some kind of dirty baseball cap on. <laughs> Um, so I felt right at, at home in it, but uh, I think it said the Loose Moose on it, which is an actual pub in Vancouver. Excellent. Um, Jesse, your death probably is the most vicious of the entire film. Um, I deserved it. Yeah. And I would say probably most people, I think, applauded after it happened. No offense. Um, but that's you heard it. Um, 
can you talk about that day of shooting? I mean, maybe it was a couple of days of shooting, but in terms of working on that, because one, I've never seen that kind of a kill before, and then two, Ken, for you, how involved were you then on the other side, or were you just sort of there to help the special effects go forward and that kind of stuff? Um, yeah, when I booked the role, it actually wasn't very clear, because in the script, it was like, yeah, he's in the bed, and he gets killed, and... I was like, okay, cool, and then I showed up, and they were like, okay, so we're doing like full prosthetics, we're gonna do your whole body, and I'm like, what? What's that? They're like, we're gonna like make a replica of your body, and I'm like, is that legal? And like, yeah. And, like, okay. and so we went ahead and did that, and it was 18 and a half hours straight, uh, because they said, well, do you want to break it up? And I was like, no, let's just do this. So we got a bunch of Mountain Dews and Red Bulls, and like it was me and six dudes, and we just like did this full body prosthetic. They brought in a team, which literally like into the arms, they put in hairs on the legs with tweezers. Like, I'm not even making this up. And I walked into the room and they're like, it's done, look at it. And I'm like, wow, I'm out. <laughs> That's, it was just so weird to see that because when you look in a mirror, you see like a reflection of yourself and you're used to that. But to go up and see yourself how everyone else sees you. I'm like, oh, that's crooked, and that thing is really there? Okay. <laughs> and um, it, was, so it was bizarre, but anyway, we went through all these tests, and ultimately the dummy looked too floppy. So they were like, okay, forget the pneumatic bed. Now we're going to go like half wheel, half fake. Let's see how that works. And so we did like three or four days of tests on this in some warehouse, just over and over and over, and me dying, and then filming it, showing Ronnie, and he's like, no, more blood, less of this, less flop, more flop. And so finally, on the day, we ended up, yeah, upper half real, lower half fake. There's like a team underneath the floor with cables and counterweights. And that had to be mixed with timing with, you know, okay, when he grabs the bed, everybody's got to push the weights because by the time he pulls the bed, then the weights will go down and the bed will come up and it didn't always work that way. But anyway, long story short, finally it just like all lined up, the beer can and all. And, and they were like, yes, there's blood everywhere and we're, we love it. Yeah, I just remember... Um you know, sort of reading it, it's, you know, you read it and, and uh, you don't know what to expect on the day kind of thing. And uh, actually, so when I when I was stabbing him, I was actually dipping the blade into a bucket of blood and, and spraying that. And I thought, that looks great, that's, that's cool. And then I knew we were going to fold the bed. I just thought, this is such a cool kill. And I, again, I didn't realize till when, like, how important good kills are in these kind of movies. And uh, so you, you grow to appreciate that when... Uh, Jesse and I uh, worked on uh, uh, Joyride 3, and yeah. the opening to that has a great, you know, kill sequence in it and stuff like that. But anyway, the, the, I just thought, this is such a classic kill, and whenever I get asked, you know, what's my favorite kill in the movie, it's that one, because nobody is expecting Jason to fold that bed, and, uh, and it was, you know, it was a bit with the timing and stuff like that, but it just came off so well, I just, I, I just loved it, and I thought, you know, people love this too, so... Well, that, that totally steals my next question. I was going to ask you what your favorite kill was. But I will go with, you're working against Robert England in this movie. Um, and I love the fact that there's 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 still an, even though Jason's a killing machine, there's still an innocence to him because he's sort of stuck in this child's mind. How much fun was it to play against somebody like Robert? Because you don't say anything, you don't get to say anything, and he gets to do all the verbalizing. And, you're almost sort of like this weird, like sort of sad sounding board for him in his frustration. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that too. You know, all those mind classes <laughs> finally paid off. <laughs> I was so into mind. Um, no, like the audition for the movie was, uh, part of it was like they did a close up of my eyes and they read the uh, uh, opening sequence of the girl swimming in the lake and stuff. And I remember uh, I got interviewed and it was in the paper, you know, sensitive eyes, you know, sell. Kurzinger as new Jason or something like that, and I, I, like literally the only thing you can see in my whole body is one eye because actually the other eye is prosthetic and is built into the mask, and uh, so you know a lot of it is body language, but we communicate a lot with body language and stuff, and, and body movement isn't anything new to me because whenever you double an actor, my background is stunt work, whenever you double an actor you study how he moves and you try and, and do the same thing and stuff, but uh, you know I was, I was Robert straight man. You know, he, he got all the lines and stuff like that. I remember we did, we did this uh, promotional thing in Vegas, and then afterwards uh, we had like 50-some-odd interviews with different people and stuff. And I'm sitting in a chair, and we have to do it in character, so I'm not allowed to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there the whole time, 50 interviews, you know, nodding, threatening, you know, stuff like that. And Robert's, you know, being Robert. And uh, so, you know, it was just... Uh, 
I, like I said, I was Robert Spring in, in that movie. Yeah. I, re I remember when they did that in Vegas because I remember tuning in on the internet because it was live on like Yahoo or something like that. That's how old, you know, this was a while back. Um, and I just remember thinking, like, it reminded me of like the early 80s when they actually did have, like Jason, I think, went on Arsenio Hall. And yeah. I think Robert was actually on Arsenio Hall. So for me, that was like a really fun throwback to like being a kid and like the fun promotion they used to do for these things. Yeah. Um, Catherine, your death in the movie actually makes me sad um, because one, it's it's sort of a sad circumstance as to how Gid meets her ending because you can tell she's grieving and she just wants to kind of forget and it's twofold because well, there she shouldn't pass out in cornfield and wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just sympathetic with that so bad because like she's you know passed out and things can things are happening around her that she doesn't know about and then she's being terrorized in real life like in her dreams. Um, how how is sort of the surreal dream sequence stuff shooting for you in the locker and all that kind of stuff. That set's really fun. It, okay, so there was an abandoned mental institution in Vancouver called Woodlands. There's two actually. There's Riverview, which is like the fun one. It's still possessed. But Woodlands was really not the fun. It was really, really scary. And I had worked all night on a different film about heroin addicted prostitutes um, called On the Corner in, in the really bad part of, of Vancouver until uh, 7.30 in the morning, and then my call time for Freddy was 9 o'clock in the morning. So I worked all night, uh, took off my crack scabs and my, my, my junky arms, and, uh, and drove to the mental institution, as one does. And, uh, and I walked into my trailer, and there was a bouquet of flowers and an 8 by 10 black and white headshot of Freddy Krueger, and it said, for Katie, my favorite victim, Love and Death, Freddy. And I was like, <laughs> And it was like, it was the most surreal, because I was already sleep deprived. And so when you're sleep deprived and or you're sleeping, and that's when Freddy gets you, and then I'm in this boiler room, and then there's Freddy, and I'm like, I don't know what's happening here exactly. Um, and it was great, like, that just sort of went to my terror, because I was exhausted and just, like, strung out, just like, oh my god, I have no idea what's happening, there's ghosts everywhere, and this whole place is haunted. <laughs> and they tore that place down, and they built condos on top of it, and people can't move out fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, don't ever build real estate on it. No. no. Mental institution. Just, just rule of thumb. Um, before we go to um, questions from the audience, which guys, if you have questions, feel free to line up. We're going to do those in a minute. Um, I'd like to start with you, Paul, and kind of go down the row and have you tell me your favorite memory for making Freddy vs. Jason. Oh, gosh. There was the, I remember, uh, I guess the thing, the thing that I thought um, uh, took the most skill on my part. When we were in the boiler room, there was that catwalk that went across, you know, and, and you know how catwalks, they're, they're metal, but they're full of holes, they're just, you know. Um, and so I had to, Ronnie said we had to do it all in one take, I had to go running across the catwalk and down the stairs, which was the same way, just full of holes, and, and, and land in a certain position, right? I, 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 I was terrified, you know. And I said, you better stay real conscious for this because if I tripped, you know, I was way up high or I could have gotten a heel caught in one of those uh, openings. Um, and I also wanted to do well for him. I wanted to, you know, come down and land as I was supposed to land. And I did. Okay? So, and I, I, I can't even frankly remember if we did it more than once, but there are times, you know, when actors... <coughs> If, you know, if you, you do something with dancing, you know, I used to be in the theater, they call it an, an actor who moves well. And if you're an actor and you really want to, you know, be versatile, you need to be an actor who moves well and pays attention and stays very conscious. You never know what you're asked to do. And that, it's memorable for me. Screaming, ah, no big deal, just scream, I can do that. <laughs> and how about for you, Catherine? Um, I mean, the being chased around by Freddy and, and when he says, you know, you're nothing to fear, but fear yourself, and you know, like that was very iconic for me. The most memorable was when I had been killed in the cornfield, and I'm lying there dead in my slutty t-shirt, my jeans, and it's November in Canada, which is not the warmest. And we have 400 extras who I've seen all night sneak off into the cornfield, like smoke weed, like drink a little bit. <laughs> and now they all have to stand.
stampede over my dead body. <laughs> and I'm just like, any second, someone's going to nail me right in the head. And I have hypothermia at this point, and I'm like shivering. And they're like, Kate, Kate. Ronnie's like, Kate, you're dead. And they're like, yes, I know that. I'm literally having a physical, my, my body shutting down. <laughs> and they came over, and, and they fed me Robaxacet, because that will, as a, as a muscle relaxant, so your body... So, good trick if you ever have to be in slutty clothes out in the freezing woods and not look like you're freezing to death. Take hardcore muscle relaxants and your body will stop moving. And, uh, and then I just laid there and I watched hundreds of feet of stoned extras flying over my face and I thought, I don't care so much anymore about this. This is lovely. And for you, Jesse. Uh, for me, mostly it was the prosthetics. It was the first time I'd ever been traumatizing. Uh, yeah, first time I've ever had someone go, okay, we're gonna put this over your head, and then you're not gonna breathe, and then when we say go, you'll blow out the two little nose holes, and if that doesn't work, then we're gonna have to rip the whole face off and start again. Uh, but if it does work, then we'll leave you under there for 25 minutes. <laughs> and I'm like, cool. And uh, so for me, that was actually a lot of fun. The, the crew was great, the team was great, and uh, to build all that and create it and. So apparently New Line Cinemas has my body somewhere in a vault, which is not cool. <laughs> Maybe I'll buy it one day, <laughs> just so no one else can have it. Selling it to an old men's bag. Damn it! <laughs> 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 uh, really? and Brian Singer, a very well-known director, was had directed it and stuff, and then we started Freddy vs. Jason, and uh, we were out at Bunsen Lake, and, and um, I get a radio message saying that uh, Brian Singer uh, is on set and he wants to say hello. And I didn't know Brian, I mean, I'd done stunts for him, and I didn't think he knew who I was or anything like that, but uh, Bunsen Lake is about a 45-minute drive from Vancouver and stuff, and, and uh, so I, I go, well, wow, so I come out of my trailer, but I'm not, and I'm not in costume, and here Brian Singer had come out with some of the uh, people from, from X-Men, and, and uh, they were all really excited about Freddy and Jason, and, and, uh, and so I walked up to say hi, they didn't come to see me, they came to see Jason, so it's like, <laughs> you see their faces sink. You know, when I'm not in costume and stuff like that, I go, I go, I go, all right, all right, give me a few minutes, I'll come back out. So I go back in my trailer and I throw on the costume, and then I snuck out of my trailer and I came around the other side of them and I walked up on them with the machete and doing the Jason walk and stuff. And, and uh, they turn around, and this one guy just about peed himself. <laughs> Brian Singer turns around, holy shit, that looks great. Oh, they got the hair. And I stood there. Well, they just walked around me looking at the costume and, and, uh, and Jason and stuff, and I didn't say anything. I just I went into character, and, and they were just so thrilled. They were like little kids, and uh, that, so that was one of the uh, big indicators again that the, that the movie was a big deal, kind of thing. And, and uh, so, yeah, that, that that stuck with me that this you know big time director would, in the middle of the night, drive all the way out to Bunsen Lake to just uh, have a look at uh, have a look at Jason. <laughs> that, that's really awesome. That doesn't happen very often. Um, I know we're we only have a few minutes. Do we have any questions? If you want to hop over to the mic, folks, go right ahead, sir. Um, I, I guess I guess it needs to be a really good question. So. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. There's only like 300 people watching. It's good. It's good. I have a question for Catherine. Uh, uh, I'm a big fan of insomnia. Uh, which Ken was the uh, stunt coordinator, by the way. Great job, sir. And uh, anyway, uh, I, I like that in movies where someone has like a supporting role or a smaller role, but it's really memorable. And I, I think that was the case with yours. And I thought you did a great job. Um, and uh, I just, uh, with that s couple of scenes you had with Al Pacino, and you had to get really worked up and cry and everything. And, and you know, he's like, uh, no exaggeration, you know, like one of the greatest actors in film history. Was was there like a uh, intimidation factor, or did he have a sense of who he was okay. at that age? Okay. And so, <laughs> so I'm an idiot, and I 
get food poisoning easily, and I ate scallops at the Super 8 Motel in Squamish the night oh. before. <laughs> and I'm in my trailer, barfing my guts out. And they sort of, they set everything up, and then when Al's ready, like, Al's ready, so they knock on the door, and they're like, I'm like, okay. And I'm like, wiping vomit off of my face. And the first scene we do is the second part of my interaction with him. After we drive in the car for a bit and I flirt with him, we, we get out of the garbage dump where my friend's body was found. He screams at me and I give him a clue when I'm crying about this. So I basically had to do nothing. I was pale, I was shaking, I was literally wiping vomit off of my face. Um, and it's really windy there and my eyes are just watering so I don't even have to try to cry. And he just like gets out and screams at me and like gets back in and they're like, okay, you're wrapped. And I just like went home. I had no idea what was happening. And so the next day, we do the driving scene. <clears throat> and there's no really like hanging out with Al Pacino in between takes, you know. But I was trapped in a car with him for eight or nine hours being driven, towed up the same road in, uh, in Squamish back and forth. And the windows are rolled up and they gave me unfiltered American spirit cigarettes to smoke, like packs of them. So I already want to die again. Yes. They're super strong and disgusting. And, um, and I'm, I'm sitting there going, okay, like, I haven't spoken to him yet. I don't know if I'm allowed to look him in the eye or say anything. Like, I don't know if he's nice. I don't know if he's a raging psychopath. So I sit there and I'm like, okay, okay, like, be cool. And I knew he just had twins and everyone likes to talk about their kids. So I was like, Mr. Pacino, um, congratulations on your, your new twins. Um, what, what did you name them? And he goes, Al and Al after me. <laughs> and I turned to the window and I was like, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck. <laughs> about being able to play poker. I was like, oh yeah, Teamsters taught me how to play poker when I was a child for like juju. I was like, totally do that. No idea what I'm doing. And I get invited to a poker game at Al Pacino's penthouse. And I call the office, I'm like, how many people are doing this poker game? Like, did he set this up to call me out on my shit? And she's like, oh, 20 or so. So I'm like, great, I can just go, have a drink, say thank you so much, Mr. Pacino, it's such an honor, and leave. And I show up, and it's Al Pacino, six producers from LA, myself, a long wooden table with like the metal suitcase with snap snaps with like the chips in them, and I'm like, fuck me, like, I just lied to Scarface, and now I have to perfect. <laughs> and I did, and I walked away with like all the money. <laughs> so yes, that's my best story. I have no other good stories, so don't ask me anything else. Food <laughs> poisoning really worked for we have, we have time for one last question, sir. It's on you. It's pretty short and easy. So can, I was just wondering how long does it take for you to get into your... Uh, you said you put it on pretty quick. And, uh, oh, yeah. Is yeah. it easy to get into? Uh, no, I, it was like one of the easiest monster costumes I ever wore because the, the, the only real uh, prosthetic stuff is the head piece, and that's like a balaclava that just pulls on like a, like a diver's hood kind of thing. And then they put a little makeup around yeah. my eyes. And then, Batman. Yeah, and then the rest of it's like <laughs> regular clothes you throw on and stuff. So I, you know, like Robert's doing three, four hours yeah. of prosthetic makeup, and I'm like, and I can't get in and out of it for any day. So, like, so it was an easy gig, yeah. yeah. All right. I got a little time for this little man. I think, I think we could squeeze him in super quick. Right. You got it, kid? You ready? Uh, All right. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Uh, so obviously, Ken, you were playing with Jason, right? When you were like fighting and being with Freddy, when he was just yelling at you atrociously all the time, how was it just to kind of ignore it? Because all of it is I, not I thought to myself, one day we'll be at the convention. <laughs> <laughs> Jason may not talk, you've been right. <laughs> so I've gotten my revenge many times over for that. Awesome. By the way, it's going. Atrocious, right? Yeah. I didn't know atrocious until I was like in junior high. Um, well, everybody, thank you so much for coming out, talking Freddy versus Jason. Be sure to listen to everybody on the side all the time. And uh, yeah, let's give it up for Ken Krizinger, Justin Hutch, Kathleen Stone, and of course, Paul Shaw, everybody. Be sure to stay here. We've got plenty more panels, we've got costume contests, but we've got all sorts of fun stuff coming up today. So be sure to hang out. Wow.